if the citizens of the world are willing to consign uh, the fruits of their labor and their intelligence, the benefit of the risks that they take to the government, if we are collectively that stupid, then the rosy future that I'm suggesting that we enjoy becomes less rosy. In this insightful snippet, Rick Rule delves into the intricate world of government, finance and global dynamics. He provocatively suggests that governments are perceived as entities designed to steal by citizens. Rick explores economic challenges faced by nations like Argentina and the United States, highlighting the impact of entitlements and growing deficits. The discussion shifts to the US dollar's role as the world's reserve currency, with Rick predicting its continued dominance despite acknowledging its flaws. He then examines the potential for a new currency in the BRICS nations, questioning the viability of a gold-backed currency. Rick raises concerns about governments transitioning to central bank digital currencies, citing examples from Canada and expressing worries about social credit score manipulation, and also emphasizes the importance of citizen education in a changing media landscape. With that, let's dive into the rest of the video to hear Rick's full thesis. Governments exist in the eyes of the citizenry to steal. What the citizens want is to steal from their neighbors and give to themselves. Uh, Malay uh, has no money. The Argentine government doesn't have the ability to benefit, sadly, to redistribute to anybody. In addition, he doesn't yet, at least, control parliament. So much of what he talks about is at present narrative. I am delighted that the Argentine society came together in a protest vote and that, uh, importantly, the protest vote in his favor it, it included the poor who understood that the alleged theft which was taking place on their behalf uh, really was taking place at their expense. I'm, uh, I'm delighted about the social awakening that occurred in Argentina. I'm nervous about the ability of uh, the current government to fashion over time a consensus of the citizenry when the citizenry believes that the government exists to favor them. Uh, that's a problem. I think in the United States, we are so wedded to what we do. We are so wedded to the concept that the purpose of government is to take from others and deliver to ourselves that we're a long ways away. Let's, let's look at one example. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, entitlements. Uh, if you're looking at the U.S. deficit, one way to do it is to look at me and visualize me as a deficit. I'm an old, fat, bald, white, rich guy. Uh, my generation, the baby boomers, voted ourselves all kinds of really cool stuff, but we forgot to pay for it. Uh, there's a political consensus in the United States that says that that is right. The idea that there's $140 trillion in inheritable wealth in the United States passing from the baby boomers to other generations uh, is held up uh, as an excuse for the social transfer. It's interesting that if you look at federal government debt, which is to say on balance sheet liabilities at $33 trillion, and off balance sheet liabilities, according to the Congressional Budget Office, entitlements, the net present value of entitlements, that number is $140 trillion, too. So we're leaving you nothing. But we are increasing your debt by $2 trillion a year. There is a broad spread political consensus that says that this ignorance of arithmetic in favor of narrative is fair. Our uh, mutual friend, who, of course, lives in Argentina, Doug Casey, describes the U.S. dollar as the worst currency in the world with the sole exception of all the others. And I continue to believe that. I'm 70 years of age. I think the U.S. dollar will be the world's reserve currency for the balance of my lifetime. I think that U.S. hegemony will be eroded as opposed to eliminated. Uh, I, I suspect that the so-called BRICS currency will evolve, if it does, into a settlement mechanism as opposed to a currency. And I think, ironically, that the BRICS currency will, at least for the balance of my lifetime, be valued <laughs> and exchangeable for U.S. S dollars. Uh, I think the president of Argentina at once made an ideological choice 
uh, to align himself with what is still a freer society than the BRICS society. At the same time, he paid attention to arithmetic. Uh, there is no debt market in BRICS. There isn't a real debt market in Yuan. Uh, the BRICS, well, first of all, it doesn't exist, but it isn't convertible yet. Uh, there, there is no depth. I, I remember once Doug Casey saying to me, uh, and to you, I think, in, in a conference, the U.S. dollar is an IOU nothing. The euro, with 17 or 18 backers, is a who owes you nothing. The BRICS, with such stalwart credits, <laughs> as formerly Argentina, <laughs> and if you look at who's applying to join it, uh, would likely be fashioned a nobody owes you anything. Remember that an unbacked currency is just that, an unbacked currency. Uh, and imagine, uh, if you will, in the BRICS, let's say that China runs a trade surplus with Russia. And at the end of the year, uh, Mr. Xi uh, goes up to Moscow with a billion bricks uh, and said, I'd, uh, this is gold backed, I'd like my gold. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Putin says, no, I think you should keep your bricks. Uh, how is Mr. Xi going to enforce convertibility unless the gold has already been surrendered from a sovereign holder to a central repository? which none of the BRICS nations, with the exception of China, are willing to do. And China is willing to do it if the repository is in China. If the citizens of the world are willing to consign uh, the fruits of their labor and their intelligence, the benefit of the risks that they take to the government, if we are collectively that stupid, then the rosy future that I'm suggesting that we enjoy becomes less rosy. If you look for examples as to what the risks might be, look at Canada, uh, where Prime Minister Trudeau overrode the rule of law uh, and seized the assets of his political opponents extrajudiciously. Look at the fondness that go the governments are expressing for a currency that they can cancel, not merely seize, if they don't look like the way you act. Look at the overprint or the potential for the overprint of social credit scores on social media, a technology that's in place in China now, with the ability of uh, countries to cancel their citizenry's wealth and savings if they disagree with the citizenry's political beliefs. I don't think that this will occur. Uh, perhaps I have too much faith in humankind. Uh, I, I'm always interested in the IMF as an acronym. Uh, you could use those letters uh, to come to a different description uh, of the organization, <laughs> which I'll leave for right. viewers' imaginations. Uh, with regards to your uh, description of the mainstream media, I, I think it's worthy to note that the mainstream media has been losing market share for a very long time. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that that's one of the reasons why. Uh, mercifully, uh, part of my rosy view of the world has to do with the emergence of many, but not enough, Cambonis. Uh, and I think it's up to the citizenry to educate themselves uh, as opposed to be passive recipients of the pablum uh, offered up by government-sponsored media. In today's insightful discussion with Rick Rule, we delved into the intricate world of global finance, government dynamics, and the future of currencies. From the challenges faced by nations like Argentina, to the ongoing debate about the US deficit and the potential evolution of the BRICS currency, Rick provided us with a thought-provoking analysis. We explored the risks associated with government overreach, drawing examples from Canada, and contemplating the implications of social credit scores. Rick highlighted the importance of citizens actively educating themselves in a changing media landscape. If you found today's insights valuable, make sure to subscribe to our channel, hit that like button, and don't forget to share your opinions in the comments section below.